Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob towards the promised land. I'm joined today by Emily Maxson and Greg Uttinger, and I am hosting today okay. Brian Broom. Uh, <laughs> we are going to be talking today about the penultimate point in Saul's life, which is his the, the culmination of his rebellion against God, his visit to the witch at Endor. Uh, and for Star Wars fans, it's not that Endor, it's, it's a different one. <laughs> yeah. In this particular instance, we have, as I said, it's the culmination of Saul's rebellion uh, before he had explicitly gone against God's commands and done exactly what God said a king would do. And now he's doing all the other things that God said kings would do, uh, <laughs> which leads to this last point here. So, Greg, why don't you take it away from there? Okay. Well, the Philistines are still out there, and Saul's been fighting them a good while. And later on, David will put into song his tribute to Saul, warring against the Philistines. And yet, for all that, there are still more Philistines. And Saul, as before, is becoming afraid. And he's particularly afraid, we're told, because God, he inquired of the Lord, but the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, Urim and Thummim, nor by prophets. He wants assurance. He wants supernatural assurance. No dreams. The Urim and Thummim, those stones or gems or whatever they were, whereby the high priest could get yes and no answers from God, were with David in the wilderness. So he had no access to there. Prophets, well, David had a prophet. Saul had no prophet, and Samuel was long dead, which is how this particular chapter, chapter 28, of uh, 1 Samuel starts out. Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned him. And it's, it's not like Saul and Samuel were on the best of terms anyhow. Uh, Samuel had stopped visiting Saul because of Saul's rebellion. But Saul is very afraid, very worried, we, and we've seen this from the beginning. Every time the Philistines have shown up, he has been afraid, afraid to go into battle, afraid he's going to lose, afraid the people won't follow him. And so now, reaching the depths of despair, he turns to his servants and says, find me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. The ancient world understood this concept maybe better than most of us do, but it, it, it's still something that mediums and ghost whispers and such try to play on the day. The idea was this. Certain people uh, resonate with the other side, and they they found a spirit who will come and talk to them. And the spirit is very handy and useful and obliging. And if you tell the spirit, uh, I got somebody here, and he wants to talk to his great aunt Tessie, then said spirit will go off into Never Never Land and come back with great aunt Tessie, who will now speak through the mouth of the medium, and you can have a direct conversation with great Aunt Tessie. Great Aunt Tessie. The, the ghost, the, the spirit that you're familiar with us is a familiar spirit. Now, that's the con. In most times in most places, it probably was strictly a con. It probably, in most times in most places, was an act. It was fake. Uh, there was nothing. It's the, the ghost whisper, the uh, medium, faking the presence of somebody else, ventriloquism or something, imitating a voice and all that. But at least sometimes, and this this is one, God allowed demons to go talk to people and visit them. Now, whether the medium understood what was going on is yet another question. The medium know that the demon is, is shamming all this because neither medians nor demons have the authority and power to pull saints out of heaven or sinners out of hell. When you're dead, you're beyond the reach of anything but God himself. So anyone who pretended to be able to call back people from the dead either was consciously lying or was himself deceived by the demon who's pretending all of this. Uh, and and we're, it's not completely clear here what this woman has in mind. But she has a familiar spirit. The text is pretty clear about that. The thing is that the law required that such be put out of the land. They could leave of their own volition or they could stay and be executed. But the that penalty, the death penalty for witchcraft, applied to an overt act committed in the presence of two or three witnesses. Saying, I'm a witch, didn't get you executed. 
<laughs> saying witches are great, great and cool and having bumper stickers to say, I love witches, did not get you executed. Your elders would probably visit with you and say, what's that all about? But it was not a civil matter. You had to actually do something that in some form uh, appealed to that which you claimed to be demonic and spiritual or which you, you were trying to hurt somebody. Uh, witchcraft was uh, often mixed up with potions, hell hallucinogenics, uh, poisons of various sorts. The Greek word for sorcerer is pharmakai, someone who uses pharmaceuticals. So th there was, it was a broad range here of what could be going on, but at least in some cases, the demons were real. And that's what Saul's hoping for, apparently, because the other is no good. But <laughs> yeah, he doesn't just want to be conned. <laughs> yeah, he's someone who could con me effectively. It, it doesn't, you know. It makes me feel better. Yeah, well, interestingly enough, the servants seem to know pretty fast where they could find one. Uh, <laughs> oddly uh, enough. Oddly enough. Yeah, well, my... my it's my, almost my, like he's set up an entire, for lack of a better term, cabinet that's yeah. uh, <laughs> just as corrupt as he is. Yeah. Yeah, well, my wife knows this lady. I, I knew a girl. So the servants come back and say, well, at the town of Indor, there's this woman who has a familiar spirit. So Saul disguises himself in, in non-royal clothing, goes with two men at night and comes to this woman and says, I pray thee divine unto me by the familiar spirit. Now, again, the word divination means more than fortune telling. To us, Fortune telling simply means the future sets. You look down the corridors of time into the future, and you see what's there in your report. Divination in the ancient world was you control and create the future by your magic powers. Hence My, the name divination, like a divine act? Yeah. Okay. Uh, or what passes over on the other side to divining rod or mm. uh, St. John the Divine. Not does it mean he's godlike. It means he's a prophet. It has a wide, the, the Westminster divines, mm -hmm. they preached. Christianity took it and gave it that twist of, oh, someone who knows and speaks the word of God. But in the ancient world, the magic was supposed to be created. Remember that uh, Balaam was a diviner mm -hmm. and he was expected to put upon Israel a curse that would actually alter the military history of the two nations involved. So he wants some kind of magic, ma magic guarantee that things are going to go well. Not just, oh, yeah, I see the future and you're so dead. Uh, that's not what he's looking for. He wants magic that will protect him and his armies. And he tells her so. Use your familiar spirit to bring up the one I'm going to tell you about. I'm, I'm going to name somebody. I want your, your familiar spirit, your friendly ghost, to go find this person. And she objects. Uh, King Saul has cut off all the uh, oracles and ghost whispers and mediums and witches and sorcerers out of the land. It, it, it would be worth my life to do such a thing. It's capital punishment. Uh, you try, this is trap. Saul swears to her by the Lord. Yeah. As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. I swear by God that I will not enforce God's law. <laughs> uh, and the woman very quickly... Uh, I'm seeing Princess Bride and uh, Miracle Max. <laughs> Max, it's on the job. What can I do for you? It's, it's, it's that. It's <laughs> it's that enthusiastic. Without a without a blink, who shall I bring up to thee? <laughs> he says, "Bring me up, Samuel." Now that may have caught her off guard a little bit because who comes to a witch to ask for ask her to raise a godly man? But you know, superstition comes in all kinds of flavors and packages and all levels of stupidity. And $20 is $20. And $20 is $20. Mm -hmm. So she's ready to go through with this, which means that she's going to talk to her demon, and her demon is going to walk out and turn around and come back and pretend to be Samuel and speak through her. But something goes horribly wrong from her point of view. When the woman saw Samuel in here for a pause for a moment, a number of commentators have said, well, this, isn't, this, this can't possibly be Samuel. Because, and, and numbers of reasons follow. Well, if, once you go to heaven, you're there. You don't get to come back to earth. This is a wicked woman practicing evil things. How would God ever stoop down and use this thing? Uh, if the message that Sam, that the so-called Samuel brings is simply one of doom and destruction, there's no offer of the gospel. So this can't possibly <laughs> be Samuel. Uh, we'll address this as we go along, but the most obvious 
reason for believing it's Samuel is um, the woman saw Samuel. <laughs> the text says <laughs> the text Samuel. Sa- <laughs> and later and on, verse 15. Secondarily, her reaction is not like, yeah, this is oh, nothing. yeah, this is totally Samuel. It's yeah. like, oh, wow, whoa, whoa, that didn't work the way it normally does. Yeah. And later on, Samuel said to Saul, um, then said, the text says at least three times that it's Samuel. Well, how could God do such a thing? He's God and can hijack anything, including <laughs> we were talking about Balaam, the false prophet, and Balaam's donkey. He hijacked both of them. Mm-hmm. Earlier, he had hijacked Saul at the beginning of his of, uh, <laughs> David's uh, run. He put the spirit on Saul, and Saul babbled or prophesied or something uh, under the spirit's influence. So God can use anything he wants. Remember that when um, after the resurrection of Lazarus, the Pharisees and Sadducees are bemoaning the fact that every, the whole world has gone after Jesus. And Caiaphas, the high priest, stands up and says, you know nothing, you consider nothing. It is expedient for one man to die that the whole nation perish not. Mm-hmm. And John, as editor, as writer, says, uh, and this he did not speak of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied. Now, Caiaphas meant one thing. We got to plot yeah. and get rid of this guy. And yet God, John says, that was a divine prophecy because of his office God put it in his mouth. He didn't know what he was talking about or what it really meant. But what it meant was Jesus is going to die for his people. So he was yeah. more right also, than he knew. Yeah. Also, that's a very interesting thing. Uh, there's a, been a discussion online this week about uh, how many meanings any any one passage or verse in Scripture has. Mm. And some people saying there's only one. There's only ever one meaning. Um, <laughs> Census literalis unis est. Yes. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. And... Um, one of the the things that I was one of the arguments I saw against just one yeah. uh, universal meaning uh, was that when people in the Old Testament wrote about things, like when, uh, for instance, David wrote Psalms, right. that we look back at them and see, wow, that is that is about Jesus. Did David necessarily know they were about Jesus? I don't think so. He probably thought he was writing about himself, his own troubles, the things that he was going through, and God still inspired it. Right. And gave it mul- a multitude of meanings, and I I always also think of uh, never the the phrase you would always say in class um, ne- never do something for one reason when you can do it for three, three yeah. never write something <laughs> in scripture when you can have multiple meanings instead of just yeah, one. This, all that has to be true is that those meanings are not at odds with one another. They have to come as sort yeah. of a like a bundle of wires feeding into your computer. They all work together to accomplish a goal, and they are not at odds with one another. Yeah. And, I, I think some of the psalms seem to be very self-consciously messianic, but some of them just mm-hmm. seem to be David suffering as a godly man. You know, p- part of the problem here is that since we're all images of God, <laughs> uh, yeah, I overlap remember, happens. Yeah, overlap happens. I, I remember talking to a pastor who eventually left the ministry. But I, in one of my older notes in my Bible class, I had spoken of, Song of Solomon is an allegory about the marriage of Christ and his church, which is not exactly how he would take it now. But I do believe it is, I believe it's primarily, uh, or first of all, I don't know if primarily is the word, but it is first of all, obviously, a love story between a man and a woman. But because of that, it is necessarily also about Jesus and, and his love for the church. Right. That's uh, always the question I have when people bring up Song of Solomon, like, is it this or is it that? Yeah, is one the, an image of the other? Yeah, the, they are necessarily, an interesting thing. This, this pastor said to me, well, by that reasoning, my marriage would be an image of Christ in the church. <laughs> well, good. It's yeah. supposed yeah. to be. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that's what Paul actually says. Yeah. So with all due reference to traditional Presbyterian reform expository or exegetical uh, approach to Scripture, let's be a little careful, guys. Uh, God can say more than one thing. Let me give you another one that we kind of skipped over. There's this, this incident that happens later, right when Saul has decided he's going to kill David and hasn't told Jonathan. So Jonathan doesn't know, but David mm-hmm. knows. Mm-hmm. And Jonathan says, no, my dad wouldn't do this. Well, you better go find out what's going on. Fine. I'll go. I'll, I'll sound dad and find out what's going on. And then we'll meet in the field. Actually, we won't meet. You'll be there on the fringes, kind of hiding. And I'll go out and I'll practice with my bow. And I'm going to shoot at something. And if I tell the boy who's collecting my arrows... Come this way, it's closer. That means, David, mm. 
it's safe for you to come in. But if I shoot past the mark and say, go on, go further, keep going, that means run for it. <laughs> and, and it's played out. You know, and, and the question is, why did God put that there? There's a lot. They had a signal would be enough. <laughs> but I think at least part of what's happening there is Jonathan's words were exactly literal. He was telling the boy, go get the arrows. I shot further. Go get it. Uh -huh. But for David, those same words meant something else because there was a background understanding. Now, if David had just can't walked in out of nowhere and heard that and said, you know, I, I feel in my heart that what he's really trying to say is he's telling me to run. <laughs> no, that's bad exegesis. But when, when you've been told this kind of thing is coming, watch for it. Yeah. Then that's a lot different. When you're told, for instance, that the sacrifices in the tabernacle and temple are images of Christ, then you're not on a line when you start saying, so the poles and the posts mean this and the incense means this. It's like, you're getting too elaborate and too detailed. No, that's part of, we've been told it is. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to figure out the details and that's biblical. Yeah. Yeah. Like so when it, Jesus begins revelation by saying, these candlesticks are the seven churches. Yeah. <laughs> blink, yeah. wink, wink, nod, nod. I'm, I'm telling you stuff. And if this is uh, if this is this and that is that, then assume that everything else also has a double or triple meaning. Uh, so these, <laughs> to these, quote Benedict from yeah. "To Do About Nothing," uh, there's a double, double meaning in that. A double meaning in that. <laughs> um, mountains are kingdoms, but the, it just it gets it begins to get complicated. And I, I I'm pretty sure what the the earlier exegetes are, are trying to warn us from, and rightly is don't get imaginative. Mm -hmm. Don't, and, and they were in some ways aiming against the earlier fathers and some of the medieval, medieval exegetes who had various levels of interpretation and you had to walk through each one of them. And the literal was the last and least important oftentimes. <laughs> um, when, when God says, take you a bullock, he means go get a bullock <laughs> yeah. and, and kill the bullock. He means kill the bull. And offer it. Okay, slice it, dice, take the skin off, put it on the altar, and burn it. He literally means that. So that's all there is. No, it's a picture of Christ, but that would be a second meaning. <laughs> no, that's actually the primary meaning, because we need to know what the book's of the book is about Jesus. Yep. That's always the primary meaning. It may not be the literal meaning, but it is the primary meaning. And the literal meaning is there to minister to the primary meaning. So I think there's some there's some basic hermeneutical rules that could be made more clear. I don't think we necessarily need to recast them, and I don't want to be called upon heresy for suggesting that scripture is you know scattered or something. But <laughs> let's let's face it: the Bible presents clear alternatives to this can only mean one thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, can, it can mean a bundle of things that are all interrelated. Mm -hmm. The tabernacle is a type of Christ, and therefore. It's a type of the church because the church is the body of Christ. But every Christian is a Christian, a Christ one, and a member of the body of Christ. And therefore, the tabernacle is an image of man restored in Christ. And the tabernacle, the ultimate, the, before Christ himself, the ultimate tabernacle was heaven. And we're told explicitly the tabernacle and the temple were pictures of heaven. Mm -hmm. Um and then, but then the Garden of Eden was also a picture of heaven. So the tabernacle is a picture, picture of the Garden of Eden. We're at like five or six now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is why this is not math, right? This yeah. is literature. This, <laughs> this is, is literature. Not... This is art. Yeah. This is not a legal code to be deciphered. And I think one of the problems, uh, this is, this is, I may be overreaching, but in my experience, some of the, the most sound, sound theology, sound theologians, Bible teachers, and systematics think like lawyers. They think, oh, like, yeah. what is the one meaning here? I This and this, did I deduce this there. You say, but what about this image? Yeah, that's, that's, that's speculative. Bible doesn't actually say that. Well, if you've read a little literature, yeah, it does. <laughs> if, if you're a theologian with a lawyer bent, read a little bit of Shakespeare and Spencer and Bunyan and Milton. And, and even Hawthorne and Hemingway, for that matter. Or mm -hmm. T.S. Eliot. And see how it's done. It, yes. <laughs> see how it's done. Alice in Wonderland, for that matter. Um, th these are standard literary techniques, and they don't do. They don't turn the text into nonsense. 
They simply allow there to be nuances and hints and foreshadowings and images and echoes at the same time. And there's nothing wrong with that. And it's not, it, but that brings in the imagination and the imagination is falling and dangerous. Yeah. Let's so look is at, your intellect. <laughs> so is your intellect. Let's talk about Arius, mm -hmm. who is one of the greatest rationalists of all time. He, he prided himself on how reasonable he was and how great his intellect was. Yeah, look what that got him. Uh, our whole mind, our whole soul, our whole aesthetic temperament needs to be bound by the word of God. Well, we got off. Oh, this one, I remember <laughs> how. But. Uh, double meanings, yeah, something. Something, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, the woman saw Samuel. Yeah. She cried with a loud voice because she's not expecting to actually see Samuel. And the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. It may be at this point that she know that he that she notices that he's you know like seven six, <laughs> which should have been a big hint a lot earlier, but she wasn't paying attention. Big hint, but a yes. ah, okay. The king said to her, "Be not afraid, for what sawest thou?" So apparently, and here we're we're touching on the fringe of how occult things work, and we should not inquire too closely. Saul could not see what she was seeing. God hijacked her and her mediumistic ability, however that works and however it's achieved, that thing which allowed her to see demons when no one else could. God hijacked that and let her see Samuel because Saul can't see what she sees. And he has to say, what are you seeing? What are you seeing? Uh, and the woman says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Elohim um, is the word. Now, the Bible uses Elohim in a number of ways. Yes, the true creator God. It's also used of false gods. It's also used of angels. It's also on several occasions used of judges and civil rulers in the Psalms. I have said you are gods and you are all the children of the Most High, but you shall die like men because you haven't judged the people. He calls the judges of Israel gods. It may mean that she saw spirits. I'm more inclined to think that what she saw was a man dressed like a judge, mm -hmm. wearing a judge's mantle, because that's what she says. He said to her, what form is he of? And she said, an old man cometh up and he's covered with a mantle. So God has, again, this is apparently insubstantial, phantasmal, whatever you want to say, invisible to his, to Saul's eyes, but she sees something and God said, well, let's let her look to him like he looked to light. So she sees him dressed as a judge. And Samuel, uh, and Saul perceived it was Samuel. He doesn't say, again, doesn't say he saw him, said, oh, hi, Samuel. But he's, he's clear that this entity that's present is, in fact, Samuel. And again, the text, the inspired writer doesn't correct him. It doesn't correct us. It says, this he said being deceived. No, it goes on. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Brian, I thought you had an insight on that, if I remember yeah, it's. Um, I thought that was kind of an odd response, but then mm. again, you know, this whole thing is odd. <laughs> to begin with. Yes. Uh, however, it it does fit with what we know of Saul from this and from previous uh, encounters with him is that Saul is very superstitious. Yeah. Uh, in all the wrong ways. Like, <laughs> You, you would think his superstition would lead him to, oh, I got to follow what God said to do to the letter. Right. But no. <laughs> um, but it's like he, he goes to this uh, necromancer, for lack of mm -hmm. a better word. I mean, that's what it is. Uh, and says, bring me bring me up Samuel. I, I want him to divine good fortunes for me on the battlefield against the Philistines. And then Samuel actually shows up. And instead of being like... I don't know. It's it's kind of like he treats Saul as though he is the one with the power that only God has. Yes. Which is also reflected in what the witch says when she says, I see a God coming out of the earth. Yeah. It's like yeah. almost like Saul goes like, yeah, you're right. It, it is. Let's bow. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very yeah. superstitious. It's very he, – he doesn't – he's lost his grip of ultimate reality. And now it's just his own false presumptions. Yeah. If we do He's take worshiping the, the creature rather than the creator. Mm -hmm. If we do take the word here in that sense, or maybe again a double sense, the ancient world worshipped its ancestors. When you died and went to the grave, you became a god. 
And so when that, when great granddad comes back and rattles his chains because you haven't been feeding him properly, you would, the ancient world, both um, children of Ham, Canaanites and Egyptians and such, but also uh, the Greeks and the Romans, they they assumed that that ghosts were great granddad coming back because we haven't taken care of him. We need to feed him more. We need to keep him happy. If we keep him happy by bringing the proper sacrifices and such, then he will bless us and protect us. If not, he's one starved ghost and he's out to get us. So, you know, bad. Um, so, yeah. It's not Marley coming back to rattle his chains and warning to Scrooge. It's no, quite something different. It's something very, very different. Oh, and in passing, if anybody wants a clear idea of uh, how the ancient world regarded their their dead ancestors, there's there's lots of technical books, but I would recommend Agatha Christie's mystery story. Mm-hmm. I believe it's called Death Comes as an End, which is oh. set which is set in ancient Egypt, and mm-hmm. since her husband oh, was yeah. an archaeologist and she had lots of archaeologist friends, she was able to to make sure that what she was presenting was historically and archaeologically accurate. And it centers around a family where uh, dad is getting old and he's the family priest and he's taking care of the sacrifices, the ancestors. But if he dies, who's next in line? Whoever is going to be next in line also gets the inheritance so he can take care of everybody who's died and then murders begin happening. So it's a really good story. I recommend to it, but it, it will give you the flavor of they really believe this stuff? Yep. <laughs> what also, was that the, title again? I believe it's Death Comes as an End. You Death that Comes... As an End. As an End. Okay. Mm-hmm. You can also see the Disney movie, what's it, Coco? Yeah. That was oh, called. yes. Very, very similar ideas. Uh, yeah, so this is not Marley coming back to warn you and give you good advice. This is This is scary. Uh, and and Saul makes his plea. I am sore distressed. He's actually fairly honest, uh, at least about some some of the obvious things. The Philistines make war against me. You know, usually, uh, and this is the point where godly kings say, but actually what they're doing, Lord, is warring you and attacking you and insulting your name. And what will you do for your name if you don't intervene? You know, this is a, this is for Saul. It's all about him. And God has departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor my dreams. Therefore, I have called thee that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. God's not answering me by prophets, so I called you. What? A prof- a, a priest, a prophet. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Dad wouldn't answer me, Mom. So uh, back here while we're in the pantry together, can you tell me what? No. You can, no. Go talk to your dad. And, no, stop that. So, yes, as you say, very superstitious and very pagan in its orientation. Samuel said, again, Samuel said, Wherefore didst, then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord has departed from thee and it's become thine enemy? Armenians of all flavors have a hard time with that because, you know, God loves everybody and God's trying to save everybody and God's desperate to keep people out of hell. Why would God ever say such a thing as, I'm your enemy. Well, because, you know, read the Old Testament and then read the Psalm book of five. Revelation. Yeah. yeah, Psalm 5 is a good start. Then read the, read the book of Revelation. Then read some of the things that Jesus says to the Pharisees, Jesus who talks more about hell than any other person in the Bible. Oftentimes, American Christians have read or had read to them selectively the parts of the Bible that seem good and comfortable. God is love, God is nice, God is gracious, God is merciful, God never hurts a fly. That's obviously in some text someplace. (laughs) But here, it's very much not that. Uh, Samuel, as God's prophet, his spokesman, his covenant representative, his covenant lawyer says, you are now officially on the enemy list. Now, now people have objected to that, but and yet there is mercy. A lot of people go through life not knowing that they're God's enemies and that God is theirs. It is a great blessing to be told before you die, by the way, God is your enemy, because that implies a couple of things. One, you're in a lot of trouble. Two, maybe there's something you should do about that. And since Saul has grown up in the full light of the gospel, as it was revealed to Israel, he knows what he needs to do. It's one last warning from the dead, something nobody ever else gets. And um, so there's there's great mercy here. Mm-hmm. 
The Lord. You can think of the uh, the rich man and Lazarus. I was just thinking of that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if he wanted someone to come back from the dead to warn his family, yeah. and Jesus said, "No, they don't need one," and that's what Saul gets, even yeah. though it's Jesus said it's unnecessary and won't help. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> totally <laughs> unnecessary. It won't help. It won't change anything. Here is Saul talking to the ghost of Samuel, come back from heaven. And he's, he, he isn't, he's terrified. He falls into despair and despondency. He does not change at all. He continues to pursue his wicked course, feeling sorry for himself all the time. Samuel goes on, The Lord hath done to him, that is to Saul, as he spake by me, for the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thy hand and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because up to this point, Samuel never named David. Saul had to figure it out. And it was kind of obvious, but now for the first time, being dead, Samuel says, yeah, the, the man after God's own heart, the neighbor that's better than you, it's David. You got it. You figured it out. Good job. How in the world do you think you're going to get around God? <laughs> oh, we can think, too, of Jonah's message. Hmm. You were talking about mercy. Yeah. Jonah didn't preach mercy. No, he didn't. And even the Ninevites were like, maybe if we change course, <laughs> yeah. God will relent. <laughs> Uh -huh. I mean, what else are we going to do? Sit here and you know be destroyed? Maybe, maybe. Um, because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce, fierce wrath against Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Uh, it's not because he visits the witch. It's not because he killed all the Lord's priests. It's not because he's been chasing after the Lord's Messiah to assassinate him. This was all signed, sealed, and delivered from the day that Saul refused to kill somebody for God. And there again is a hard thing for most American Christians. You mean Saul's punished because he wouldn't kill somebody? Mm -hmm. he's, he's a king. He bears the sword, not in vain. That's his job. And God told him so in no uncertain terms. There was no room for being vague or, well, I'm not sure if that's if case law applies here that way. God told you what to do. Directly. Directly. <laughs> and remember, it was at that time that God said, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. Well, and here we are. More yeah, little... All of this is just an outflow from yeah, that. From that, yeah. He would not listen to God's prophet, and so he ends up finding his own prophet, his own false religion, his own way to God, or it's supernatural. And now it's brought damnation on him. The little moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. And, and some have said, oh, so they're all going to repent and go to heaven. That's not what that means. <laughs> because Saul does not repent. He kills himself, and there's no evidence that between the time he falls on his sword and he expires, that he did anything but feel sorry for himself and writhe around in pain. Uh, it simply means you're going to be dead. You're going to be in the grave. Uh, again, again, so warning. Samuel does not say, and you have absolutely no no possibility of repentance, don't even try it, the gospel doesn't reach to you. He does not say that. Saul already knows the path of repentance. And Samuel's just saying, clock's ticking, bud. You're running out of time. Are you going to do something or not? Well, what and also, he, it, 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 when he says, like, you're, you and your son shall be with me, like, he's in... Sheol, like he's in yeah. the land of debt of the dead. Right. He's basically just saying, "You're gonna die. Yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna be with die. me." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th and, I think it's so interesting how the the witch, when Samuel first appeared, saw him coming out of the earth. Yeah. Whereas we think of him coming back from heaven, would he come down from the sky? Nope, it was <laughs> out of the earth. Out of the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the Lord also should deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. And the signal's broken, apparently, at that point, because Saul falls straightway all along the earth. There was a lot of him to fall. <laughs> and there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all day, nor all night. So the visitation is over. Saul has collapsed. He has no strength. He hasn't gotten himself ready for battle, even by eating. The woman came to Saul and saw that it, it, it is significant that she's the woman. She's a woman, she's a witch. We're never told her name. No doubt people knew her name. It's irrelevant. She's the witch at Endor. Um, the television sitcom Bewitched took Endor and turned it into a proper name, Endora, which became hmm. 
the the name of uh, Samantha's mom, um, played by Agnes Moorhead. Huh. Uh, but it, it's important that it, it, we're to consider the witchness of this. We have seen people who are the woman who bring forth the child and who drop stones on the bad guy. Here we have a woman who represents something else. Uh, this is femininity twisted in the worst possible way. Because here she comes as a nurturer. She saw that Saul was so troubled and said, Behold, thy handmaiden hath obeyed thy voice, and I put my life in thy hand, and have hearkened unto thy words which thou spake unto me. Now therefore I pray thee, hearken thou also to the voice of thy handmaiden, and let me set a morsel of bread before thee, and eat, that thou mayest have strength, and that thou mayest go on thy way. She offers, the witch offers to feed him, to prepare a meal for him as a witch, because remember, that's all we got. She's the witch, and she offers him food. Saul initially declines. I will so not eat. The, uh, the language there of hearken to the voice of your handmaid, that's also the language used of Abraham listening to Sarah when she suggests bringing yeah. <laughs> Hagar into the mix. <laughs> Yeah, the, this is the woman not doing what she's supposed to be doing. Yeah, it's all not right the for voice her. of God, which you were supposed to be listening to. Yeah, she which is be. also interesting because uh, the Virgin Mary describes herself as the handmaid of the Lord. Right. Mm -hmm. It's it's like these people are are basically saying, "Look, I am I am your handmaiden, you earthly individual." But yes. Mary rightly places herself as the handmaid of the Lord instead, and. Uh, her identity is found outside of the earthly authorities, even though mm -hmm. that she may be rightly under them in some sense, yeah. but she places her identity as I'm the handmaid of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I think you've, you've made an interesting parallel that it's easy to miss because if you talk about occult and magic, um, unless you're heavily into some virgin cult, Mary's probably the last name that's going to come up because when we consider Mary biblically, there's nothing witchy about her. There's no occult. There's no magic. There's nothing. Her conception of the baby Jesus was not magic. It's not her manipulating God. She did not do something to acquire divine power or status or divine presence. She simply submitted to the word of God, be it according to your word. But here, this woman, taking on the role, of, as you say, of Saul's handmaid, is trying. He, she's trying to play the nurturing role by giving him food. But, you know, there are some women you should not want to nurture you. <laughs> and, and, and Saul's instincts are, for, are good at first. He says, I'm not going to eat. But then his servants, as you say, his cabinet, they kick in. And um, together with the woman, they compel him. They make him eat. And he hearkens to their voice. So he arose from the earth and sat upon the bed. Okay, he's now, it's now, it's, it's an image. It's it's a figure, but here he is sitting, he's on the bed of a witch, eating food at her hand that she's prepared. This doesn't, it doesn't get much worse than this, <laughs> at least in terms of the imagery involved. No, he doesn't actually have sex with the lady, but it's, it's telling that the intimacy has reached the point that the Bible points out, yeah, he's on her bed, she's feeding him. Counter this with JL. Mm. Yes, come ah, in. Yes. <laughs> I'll bring you some milk. I'll bring you a blanket. I'll stand and tell everybody there's no man here. <laughs> Different way of being feminine. Um, so he, the, the woman had a fat calf in the house. I still don't understand why people just have fat cats, fat calves lying around, but she did. <laughs> and she hasted and killed it. And then this is going to take some time because you got to kill the thing and bleed the thing and then cut Butcher the meat. it. Yeah. And then it, prepare the meat and then cook the meat. Yeah. And at the same time, you're doing bread, but unleavened bread. There's not time to let it rise overnight. So, and at this point, it's night and we're serving unleavened bread. There's a little hint of Passover here, mm -hmm. but what a Passover. Um, and she brought it before Saul, before servants, and they did eat. And they rose up and went away that night. And it's not an accident that this is happening at night. This is part of the stage dressing. Yes, Saul did it for a practical purpose so people wouldn't recognize him. But God draws attention to it to say, you know, Judas is told to go do what you do quickly. And the text says, and it was night. 
Well, of course it was. Jesus has said this is the hour of the power of darkness. And Saul has fallen under such an hour. He's, he's abandoned the light of God's word. He himself brought it upon him that there should be no prophets, no Urim and Thummim, that God is his enemy. And now he turns toward the devil to find some kind of solace, some kind of comfort, some kind of direction. And it all fails. And I, I believe the next lesson probably we will see Saul's suicide. Because you said this, this is the pinnacle of Saul's rebellion, and yet there is one more step. He kills himself. He murders himself. Uh, because he's not courageous. He's not strong. He's not full of faith. He can't handle it. And in the end, he collapses and just gives up on life and, and fulfills Samuel's prophecy, goes to hell. And it's a very sad story. It's, um, you know, it's one thing to say, well, he deserved it. Yeah, of course he did. But so do we all. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. God had been so merciful and given him so many chances. And um, he does the same for us most of the time. This is the kind of thing you mourn over. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. David was relieved when he hears uh, of Saul's death. And yet at the same time, we don't hear that relief verbalized. What we hear is great mourning. Mm -hmm. God had done that, had used this man to do great things. Yeah, he was trying to kill me, but at the same time, God used him to protect and preserve Israel and to make her economically more successful than she had been. Um, and so God, uh, da uh, David weeps for him. He does not triumph in that sense over his enemy's death. It's uh, it's interesting too that that just it reaffirms the fact that David is the uh, the one in the right because he he recognizes the I guess uh, I don't know what the word is now like there's fitting mm. unfitting the <laughs> unfittingness yeah. of the the authority that God has put in place to to go out that way. In, yeah. a, in a violent, self-inflicted way, and you know, he mourns over it because he he recognizes the authority that God had placed in Saul, mm -hmm. even if God was the one who took Saul out of that authority in His providence. Um, a couple things now about magic and demons and such today. When the gospel came into the world, and this this we read through the throughout not only Jesus' ministry but particularly also in the Book of Acts. Well, let's go back further. Even in the Old Testament, if God's there were demons, but if God's prophets were on the scene, they were on a short leash. Sure, the Egyptian magicians cast down their rods and they became snakes. It was an optical illusion. The text says they became snakes. Moses threw down his and it gobbled theirs up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, God God would some let, sometimes let demons show off a little only to squash them all the more thoroughly. At other times, you can think of the prophets of Baal calling on Baal, and the text says there was none to hear, none to answer. And in our, our rationalistic 21st century minds would say, of course not, because Baal's not real. No, that's not the point. There were demonic powers at work there, and God had shut them up. They would have loved to have propped up Baal worship in Israel. And God had said, shut it. And whatever response these priests of Baal were used to getting, they weren't getting it. They suddenly were all on their own. <laughs> and God wasn't letting anything interfere. And so throughout the Old Testament, when demons do try to flex their muscles and God's prophet is on the scene, they're stuck. They can't do anything. Then Jesus comes. <laughs> and in the beginning, the, the first one or two times he encounters demons, they try to cop an attitude. That doesn't work. And before oh, too no. long, we have he just shows up and they say, no, no, <laughs> yeah. it's not the day yet. Not, not today, not today. Let us go to the pigs, please. Fine, go. Ah! Have fun that, there. <laughs> that was amusing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> then we come, but we come to the book of Acts. And particularly at, at Ephesus, Paul has some interesting encounters. He meets... And he wins to Christ a great many people who were dabbling in the occult arts. And they, coming to Christ, eventually take all their magic, their books on magic, and burn them. Um, this was a, this burning books is a thing that we kind of associate sometimes with Christian fundamentalism. 
and the temptation to see evil in things and to make a big show of it, you know, burning. I, I, I know years and years ago, I would be told by my students, yeah, there was this, this big rock and roll burning party at our <laughs> church. I mean, this is back. I think this was even before D and D's. This is probably still when we had vinyl records, <laughs> and um, we would, uh, and we were all supposed to throw our our rock and roll um, records into the fire. And when we did, we started hearing squealings and screamings, and that was we were told that was the demons cutting out of them. No, that's More what happens plastic. when you. That's what happens when you burn plastic, dear. <laughs> oh my goodness! Um, also, you're burning plastic, and I, you know, probably breathing that in. Yeah, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> You know, but in Paul's case, there's an obvious approval. Yes, these books, you don't need to be reading them and you don't need to be selling them to Goodwill so someone else can read them. Mm -hmm. They need to go away, just like idols. And so there was a great burden. And we're, we're even told in the context how much it was a lot of money that these people had invested. But something else that was going on is that there were roaming Jewish exorcists who tried to cast out demons on their own and apparently were having some apparent level of success. In other words, the demons played the game with them. But these, these exorcists had found a new magic word. It was the word Jesus <laughs> because they watched Paul do this. And Paul was so successful casting out demons that let's try that ourselves. We're told there they was even seven. listed a secondary source, yeah. Jesus, whom Paul preaches. Yeah, yeah. These, these yeah. seven sons of Sceva went to a man who was possessed, and they, they say to the demon, you know, we command thee in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, that you come out of the man, and the demon through the man's vocal cord says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, who are you? <laughs> and then jumps on them and beats them and pounds them <laughs> and bloodies them until they come and tears their clothes off until they run out of the house screaming and naked. And everybody hears about this. So the true champions of God's word were able to dispose of demons without any difficulty. Yeah. The people who just tried to play the game got themselves in a lot of trouble. There's one other story. Um, it was actually in Philippi. Paul and Silas come to Philippi and they're preaching, and a young woman who is a prophetess, a seer, a diviner, demon-possessed, begins following them and claiming, these men are servants of the Most High God who show us the way of salvation. So Paul and Silas are getting advertising from Satan for free. <laughs> After a while, they decide they don't want that. For, <laughs> I would think obvious reasons. Now, there's some people you don't want sitting on the platform with you at the revival meeting. <laughs> um, yeah, we got a Buddhist guy over here. We got a Hindu guy. We got a Jehovah's Witness, and they're all in favor of this revival. No. <laughs> um, and so, and the, and the woman has said she had it said she had a spirit of a python. Um, python is a symbol of Apollo, the pythoness. The, the pythoness was the oracle of Delphi, fortune teller, demon possessed. Um, yes, with a little help from some strange gases they pumped in. <laughs> uh, but this this woman actually had some kind of demon. And it was Paul again with the word just dispatches it. And so on. Um, when the gospel confronted a demon infested world, the demons ran away screaming. And we get a taste of this in uh, St. Athanasius is on the incarnation of the word. One of the proofs he uses to show that Jesus is indeed divine is that any that the world was full of demons. There were oracles and magicians and diviners and all that. But any time the gospel shows up, the oracles would shut down, the magic would vanish, and the demons would run for their lives. Just the very presence of a worshiping church in a city pretty much meant that that was over. You know, the Jews didn't have it that good. Because how many times did Jesus go into a, a synagogue and find someone possessed of a demon? Think about going into church next Sunday and saying, oh, there's Bud. You know, we all know he has a demon. What? <laughs> it's not, I, I, I've actually. When you try had, going to your average Pentecostal church, and you'll see that happens a lot. Yeah, I was about to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I've had Pentecostal students say, yeah, there's this guy who goes to our church. Is he even puts that? Why is he in your church? And why yeah, have why, cast the why demon haven't out? you dealt with this yet? Uh, um, uh, and and I, I've got a friend right now who is really struggling with this, these kind of thoughts because he's, he, in his home, things tend to move by their own. Now, I've 
seen enough of the world, enough of life to believe that such things are quite possible. I've actually had friends call me and say, uh, there's, well, the first one said, I, I, I need, I need to talk to somebody. He asked for a phone number, a friend of ours. And I would found out later why, because there's something moving things around in my house. And I would like it to leave my bedroom, please. But then I got the same kind of call from one of my students. Yeah, my girlfriend, uh, she used to practice the occult a lot, and um, she's trying to break with that. But there's something in her room that keeps moving things. So it's possible. You know, but it's not always that. I am, after all, a scientist of sorts. I have a degree in physics. And I love mysteries. So my first thought is, okay, I am open to the possibility of a haunting, not ghosts, but demons. However... Let's look into some medical things first, and let's check your wiring. Uh, and I think we, I think we found some answers that don't require um, demon involvement. But my friend was very, very terrified of these things, and I've had to remind him. You know what, my friend? I don't care if sit, Satan comes in after church and sits down with you on your couch on Sunday. So what? Jesus walked around with Jesus for an entire day during the temptation. That didn't mean Jesus somehow had failed in his faith and holiness. Uh, and he that's in you is greater than he that's in the world, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So this has been the case. Now, where the gospel is not yet gone, the mission field, we still get reports <laughs> of weird demonic kinds of things. And some yep. people are inclined to brush them off. It's, oh, that's superstition and hearsay, merely anecdotal. But we keep hearing about it. But what happens generally is once the gospel takes firm root, such things go away. The antidote to magic is the preaching of the gospel. Mm -hmm. We don't, and we don't need to engage in pseudo white magic. And that you know there are manuals on how to cast out demons. Well, first talk to the demon and get its name. Why are you talking to a demon? This is not smart. Jesus did, but he's Jesus. The rest of you, no, don't 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 be talking to demons. That's not. <laughs> You're going to say something to them, say the Lord rebuke you. Um, talk to Jesus about them. He's the one who's in charge. Let him deal with them. Uh, and then you can start preaching. You can start singing hymns. <laughs> they don't like that at all. Um, this reminds me of a story my mom told. Um, she went to a missionary school. And I think it was one of her professors had known someone who may have People were suspecting that he had a demon. He had come back from, I don't know, out, outlandish places. Uh -huh. um, and so there was some legitimate concern. And so the professor took took this guy on a on a car ride and just every now and then would ask him, hey, did Jesus Christ come in the flesh? <laughs> and, and the guy would always go, yes, yes, he did. <laughs> and so then they finished their car ride and it's like, I don't think he's demon possessed. Check his thyroid. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, you all know you both know my story because it's not mine. It's my mentor, Pastor Powell's story, and this really happened. And some people out there, oh, oh, it's this story. Uh, <laughs> there was a uh, faithful Sunday school teacher in Southern Oregon. His name was I don't know his last name. I don't remember. I probably told this boy, but my pastor always called him Brother Randall. And Brother Randall was teaching Sunday school one day in church and. He, for some reason, got off on the subject of Ouija boards and just said, yeah, and Ouija board, that's something else you should never have in your house. And some guy who I now call Brother Smith or Brother Bob, depending on what mood I'm in, um, kind of snorted at that. And Brother Randall, being the kind of guy he was, didn't let it pass. He said, well, Brother Smith, you got one of those things in your house, don't you? Um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. All right, well, I'm not going to tell you to get rid of it, but I'm going to tell you the next thing you got that thing working you ask it a question. You ask it if Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Okay, okay, okay. You don't know. And so the lesson went on. Well, sometime later, Brother Smith came back to Brother Randall, very shaken. Hmm. He said, you know, I thought you were full of it. I thought you didn't know what you were talking about, because I'd used the Ouija board lots and lots of times. Nothing bad ever happened. Um, but I had promised you in front of a lot of people that I would ask <laughs> it the question, is Jesus Christ coming in the flesh? So I did. And it had been working just fine. And suddenly it stopped. And, you know, it was weird because it always answered me. So I tried again, is Jesus Christ come in the flesh? And letter by letter, it spelled out the words, no, damn you. 
and stop working. Oh, goodness. Yikes. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> so, but those things are increasingly rare, or they were and generally are, until the gospel that begins to decline. In the high renaissance in the 1960s when we took a full turn toward the east and decided to study magic in the occult and eastern philosophy suddenly we began to get these kind of things again when the flames burn low we start seeing the eyes out there in the darkness but the solution is not white magic it's not some kind of how-to book on casting out demons it's the faithful preaching of the gospel and the disciplines of godly faith and obedience yeah uh, there's there's a danger one of the churches in revelation jesus says you you keep talking about knowing the deep things of satan stop that <laughs> you don't need to know all that the devil's doing you don't need to know about all the occult you just need to preach the gospel you need to be faithful to my word and call on me i got the demons covered the blood of jesus covers that, as you say, greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. doesn't mean that the, the devil is not occasionally a problem, but it doesn't, if he does, if he is allowed to manifest physically, he's no threat. Mm -hmm. he, he's, he's like a barking dog who is on a leash and he knows he can't break the leash. He's just hoping we don't. <laughs> yeah. And just call his bluff, start singing psalms and start preaching the gospel, and pretty soon he'll drift away. Um, Lewis in the Screwtape Letters says that there are two uh, opposite mistakes we can make about the demon. One is to deny him in our rationalism, not believe in the supernatural, or as Christian rationalists say, well, that may have happened one time, but it's not today. Now these reports are just nonsense. But the other is an unhealthy fascination. And this can come not only from those who are actively consciously involved in occult and magical things, but from Christians who are doing things that are in principle just as magical, but they call it something else. Yeah. Um, back in my hometown, there is a certain church, which I will not name, but once it was a, a champion of truth, but over the years it drifted. And not so long ago, a few years ago, it was advertising its services. And as you read them, basically, they were promoting a healing ministry that sounded exactly like white magic. Here, and they even had a resurrection team. Mm -hmm. If you if somebody had died, they would send up the resurrection team and try to raise. You know, it, somehow it didn't work, <laughs> which surprised them, I guess. And then, yeah, I think COVID closed it down because, wow. Well, the irony continues. The the healing room is closed due to the ongoing coronavirus pandemic. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because Jesus wins. Yeah. And we can also think about just when when Christ died and when he rose, kind of combination, that was him stepping on the serpent's head, crushing yeah. it. And it's still writhing around but it's dying yeah. it is failing and falling away and honestly at least for the christian we shouldn't be worried when the worst thing that a demon can do is nudge a, a, a something on a table three yeah. inches <laughs> yeah it's it's look not at the tremendous power I Wow, oh, you moved it three infinite inches. Infinite cosmic Move. power. Yeah. Any bit of living space. <laughs> yeah, my cat normally knocks it off. When the <laughs> demons can't even do what a cat can do. <laughs> or does this just prove that cats are even more powerful demons? <laughs> that's my yeah, that's my new head cat. Now, now they I may believe. be. Yes, indeed. One last <laughs> thought in light of some of the, of the notes that you wrote earlier. I don't remember if you said this, but it occurs to me. When we get to the book of Revelation, we see a tyrant called the beast and he's backed up by a false prophet mm -hmm. and it's the false prophet who actually animates the image of the beast and gets people to worship it and to get the number and all that stuff there's a combination a uh, a, treat, a treaty an agreement between apostate civil government and apostate religion and they play to one another back up one another and yet Jesus has both their numbers. It's not, yes, they can cause some damage, but in the end, they end up in the lake of fire. 
who Jesus is in the process of slaying them. And um, yep. he continues to ride through history, wielding the sword from his mouth and slaying anybody who gets in his way. And, and so again, this is one where we get to, we do get to end optimistically. Jesus has won, and Jesus keeps on winning. And if you have been having trouble with occult manifestations, demonic activity, something like that, one, get over it. Two, call on Jesus. Three, learn more of the gospel. Turn to Christ. Um, the devil does not like the full light of the gospel. And then Luther suggests laughing at him too, but that's not quite as. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, it's funny. I remember uh, years and years ago when we first moved in. My parents and I first moved into uh, our house that we lived in for many years. Um, I remember all like we we had a couple people come from the church. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents were and still are uh, Word of Faith Pentecostals for anyone who doesn't know listening right now. Uh, and I remember we all stood in the living room and it was probably an hour and a half, which to a seven-year-old me felt like years. <laughs> yes. um, and it, the whole time it was just, it was them praying and which I'm, I'm not going to come down on praying, like get people over <laughs> well, and, that's and pray good. together. <laughs> that's praying great. Is, praying is good. Yeah. But, uh, it kind of felt a little bit white magic y because it mm -hmm. was like, we are here. We like, we're consecrating this house and we're going to, we're praying against all the, the, the demons and all the things. And it's not, they're not going to come in this house. We're, we're telling it now. And looking back, I'm, uh, I had forgotten about it until like two weeks ago. And now just looking back at it, I'm like, that is the wrong way to do things I think. It, it's like well we've already prayed up in this house so nothing can get through we we've we've um you know we've taken the pinch of incense and we've thrown it on the cornerstone of the house <laughs> and everything's and dandy this one's good for 15 years the warranty's on it you know yeah <laughs> it's not not great no um you you understand the idea of wanting god's protection over your home and wanting to dedicate oh, yeah. what you have to god yeah, and, and 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 as you say, there's nothing wrong with praying. Um, but there's nothing there's wrong with asking for protection either. No, there's not. Uh, but when you start turning it into ritual, it just you get the feeling that maybe there's a misunderstanding here. Maybe it's just a tradition in the way people are raised, and maybe we should not criticize. But it depends on who's doing it, why they're doing it, and how they're doing it. It's just that feeling of. Well, if you do, it's when someone comes along and says, but if you do these things, then as you say, we will guarantee that <laughs> prayer is not magic. Prayer doesn't, prayer doesn't guarantee, guarantee anything. No kind of dedication or rededication project ever forces God to do anything, nor supplies some kind of metaphysical boundary against evil spirits. What you do is you call on God to be your God and to help you and to take care of you and trust that he knows what that means. Uh, I have learned to pray for my daughters, for their safety and for our family safety. Growing up, I just kind of, you know, well, I'm a, I'm a good Calvinist and all things work together. So I'm not even going to really think about this. And, uh, a number of people, particularly our, our headmaster, Richard Batista, has made a big deal about praying for protection, very consciously, very regularly, about very specific things. Yep. You know, parking cars in the parking lot where there are 200 cars coming in. Yeah. Um, and other things that are, are constant everyday things where, yeah, you know what? Kids could get hurt with that. And I've learned from that this this is it's wrong to presume upon God. God knows everything, but he likes to be asked. Mm -hmm. um, and it is good to regularly ask God for his protection and his care and his intervention on a physical level, but also on a spiritual level. Yeah. And if things I... started moving around my house without any conscious entity seeming to do so. One, I would look for the wires and, and, and levers and <laughs> magnets, but two, I would also ask God to kick out anything else that might be there. Yeah. But when we start turning into here is the ritual whereby you sanctify your house to God and the demons will never get it. And don't yeah, get I the think, words wrong. Yeah. And yeah, at that point, you're you're pressing magic. I uh, I just on that point too is that one of the things that I've I've noticed I've become a lot more particular about is every day thanking God for safe travel. 
Yes. Especially since I live in the Midwest in winter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need protection. Every I day. drive country roads to work every day, this week accepted. It's And you're not it's, used yet to driving in snow and ice, are you? I've, you, I've you gotten, gotten a... To, you got an acclimator par- real fast? Pardon the pun. I've had a nice crash course in, uh, <laughs> in driving in snow and uh, somewhat on ice. Most of the time, the ice is melted. The roads are plowed and salted. Uh-huh. Even even the country roads get pretty well taken care of. I think the only real exception is like there's, there's two roads, uh, two turns on the way to work right towards mm-hmm. the end that are very country and mm-hmm. do not get very much attention but all that to say is like life is unpredictable and yes. driving is unpredictable in even the best of weather states right um so i've i've noticed that i i am very very more particular about it and um i i thank god every day it's like thank you for you know giving us safe travel to church and back from work and back and that I get to be at home uninjured, enjoying mm-hmm. dinner with my wife. It's yeah. all grace and all blessing. And mm-hmm. so it, it it also doesn't hurt to, A, continue to pray for that and say, please continue to give a safe travel. I've prayed that multiple times. But also, thank you for your grace and mercy and having given this to us. Sure. And, yeah. uh, and for those people who can't tell from my voice, I'm currently ill. Being sick with something really makes you remember like all the times you weren't <laughs> sick yes. and all the times that God has like kept you say this, I went two years through this uh, pandemic thing and didn't mm-hmm. catch the, the yeah. dreaded coronavirus. And now I've got it. And it just kind of comes across like, you know, God, you really did prevent me from getting this. I don't know mm-hmm. why. I don't know why. You didn't give it to me before because it seemed like everybody was getting it, but now everybody is getting it (laughs) and I've gotten it. And, you know, thank you for taking me away from that. And for, you know, I'm, I don't know how, how far through this I am. I, I've stopped keeping track, but I'm okay. And God has preserved my life. He's preserved the life of me and my wife together. And that is something to praise God for. Absolutely. Yeah, it's not. You don't need to go out and buy talisman and magic charms and say Christopher medals. You simply need to talk to your heavenly Father. Mm. Well, with that, we probably should turn toward recommendations, and I'm hoping yes. that both of you have some. Yeah, I have one. Um, I was thinking about this because of what we were saying about, you know, the worst the devil can do to us is move things around our house, pretty much. <laughs> um, right. And that's that's true for us as those in whom the Spirit of God dwells. But I also really have appreciated a podcast called Cultish. I'm not sure if I've recommended it before. Mm. Um, I don't agree with all of their theological perspectives necessarily, um, but they have done some really interesting work in pulling together some ideas of different cults and different like UFO stuff and different Mm. occult stuff um, and try to look at this, like, is this a spiritual reality and what is, what is the story God's telling with the people he brings out of that? Mm -hmm. Um, So they had, um, they had several different guests. Um, One of them Andrea Schwartz, I believe. Oh, I know, and- I know Andrea. Yeah. Was she in Scientology? Was that her story? Or I don't apparently don't know her backstory, but oh. she um, <laughs> she worked for Calcedon, or she yeah. works with Calcedon now. Mm-hmm. And she, when we were trying to get a uh, online learning program going with the school, she volunteered her daughter as a, a test case. And so she... Um, she got to watch our class online and um, yeah. And, and then eventually he came and came and visited us one day just to see who are all of these people whose voices I keep hearing. I see them. <laughs> but yeah, her mom is also the, the lady who hooked me up with the guy for whom the gentleman for whom I ghost wrote for so long, who mm. uh, works with uh, or owns heirloom. Audio oh, yeah. productions. Audio books. Oh. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've talked to uh, uh, Andrew a number of times. So, anyway, you were saying. Yeah, she's one of many fascinating guests that have appeared on this podcast that talks about things. And it was listening to it. I could only do it in really small doses because I, mm-hmm. I do get freaked out, you know, <laughs> <laughs> too much. Um, but, you know, an episode here or there is a really good reminder, kind of like reading Augustine's City of God, where it's like, oh, no, serving demons is really, really oppressive and terrible and a horrible life to live. Yes. Which is easy to forget in, like, you forget that it's real in this safe and clinical, Mm -hmm. gospel-drenched society um, that we still have, even though the gospel's kind of... Drying out. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we're we're working on it. We're working on it. (laughs) But, uh, you know, even... It's so easy to forget the reality of how awful demons are. So... Yes. Yeah. That's why I recommend Cultish. Um, Greg, do you have a yeah. serious recommendation or a whimsical <laughs> one? Because I feel like we should end with a serious one, and mine is okay. whimsical. All right, well, then you do your whimsical first. Okay. My recommendation is um, to watch bad movies with your loved ones. <laughs> so you can lock them together. <laughs> a, it's just fun time spent together. You're, you're together, you're doing something. And B, you can also like talk about story and like why this thing doesn't work as a story or what they could have done better uh which in the case of the movies we watched this week were literally anything they could have done anything to be better <laughs> um and if you're curious uh we watched the divergent series <laughs> and it's so bl- it's so bad like i i'm not even going to talk about it. i'm i'm so upset know about what it this is i'm afraid to ask now I'll I ask will you explain afterwards. when the call is <laughs> done. <Okay. laughs> um, but yeah, it, Emily and I watched it. We've been sick. So this was like our sick week at home movie night watching thing this week. And it was really fun because we're also exhausted. You know, by 930, we're both like, turn it off. We need to go to bed. So three movies has lasted us this whole week. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, just watch it doesn't have to be bad movies. You can watch good movies with your loved ones and it's the same end result. You can talk about what the, the movies do well. But, but, if, but if they're bad movies, they won't be upset when you talk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, the, that's the ideal. Yeah. So yeah, that, uh, that, was, that was our activity in the evenings this week and it was really, really quite fun and enjoyable even if the movies themselves were not. <laughs> well, I'm going to recommend a book I kind of alluded to but didn't name. It's by Oz Guinness. It's called The Dust of Death, A Critique of the Counterculture. It's published by InterVarsity or was back in 1979. I don't know if it's still available fresh, but I'm sure you could find a used copy someplace. He looks at the, the counterculture of the 60s and at various phases of it. And one chapter is called Encircling Eyes. And uh, his was the image I borrowed of the campfires are burning low and look out there. You see the eyes looking in from the darkness. And his comparison was that that's what uh, demonism is like with our culture. As long as the fires of rationality and faith are burning, the demons stay out there where you can't really see them. But when those fires burn low, when there's no faith and therefore no reason, the eyes start showing up all over the place. Things are watching you. And he addresses it from a Christian point of view. So dust of death, a critique of the counterculture, Osgiddus. Well, thank you all so much for joining me and for those excellent recommendations. You can follow us on YouTube, on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook, where we drop dank memes occasionally. And you can uh, subscribe to us on any any podcast catcher that you happen to use. If you uh, hated tonight's episode and want to tell us all about it, you can email us at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Uh, we want to say thank you to all of our financial supporters as well. And if you uh, have listened and you did not hate everything that we've said uh, and would like to support us, you can do so through uh, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Also, a thank you to David Maxson, our editor and 
tech extraordinaire. See you next time.